what I was thinking about doing today, uh, if you guys could just, was talking primarily about the project because I'm sure that has occupied a significant fraction of your thought processes over the last couple of days, and it will continue to occupy a significant fraction of your thought processes over the next couple of days. And um, I was thinking about the project myself and thinking about what kind of topics you guys might be a little confused about or, or want some more um, intuition about. So I, I have a list of, of topics that I will try to cover in the time, um, and I'll write those down. And so that is... So a couple of different blocks. For that diff pair uh, circuit with the differential to single-ended conversion, calculating swing. I assume this is big enough. Like people were telling me that I wasn't writing big enough last time. This is good. Swing and common mode gain. OK. Um, invariably, as uh, Professor Broderson mentioned the other day in lecture, you're gonna you're not gonna be able to do all this amplification. You're not gonna be able to meet all the specifications in one stage of an amplifier. So it's going to be at least a two-stage amplifier. So actually, let's say multi-stage amplifier. On that, um, figuring out how to sort of the bias interconnect, how to how to size the devices and the bias currents such that uh, things just kind of work well together. Then for the output stage, so topologies to consider, and realistically there's one primary topology, um, gain of the output stage, And how that is, um, that's uh, sort of depend. That's dependent on your swing. And sort of choices for currents in the output stage, and uh, and uh, a little bit about swing and VD sats. And then also talking a little bit about the test benches, and in particular, test bench two, what's going on in there. So these are the topics that I think you all might be interested in hearing a little bit about. Um, are there any other topics with regards to the project or the course material that Professor Brotherson has been discussing that you'd like to see on this list? Okay, looks like I've covered most stuff then. So just by a quick show of hands, um, which of these do you most want me to spend the most amount of time on? So let's go through each of these and I'll tailor my section discussion based on um, what gets the most, the strongest response. So just by a show of hands, and you can vote for more than one, um, who really wants to see the stuff on the diff pair swing in common mode gain analysis? Okay, just about everybody. Who wants to see stuff on the multi-stage amplifier and how to inter how to set up biases and currents to get the interconnect working? Okay, almost everybody. Who wants to see stuff about the output stage? <laughs> right on. You know, I'm really glad because what this means is that I picked the right topics. And who's curious about the test benches? <laughs> Anyone want to flip a coin? Um, so we'll just we'll just go in. It looked as if the diff pair and the output stage were the most interesting or relevant or whatever. So let's start talking about the diff pair. Okay? And because I'm choosing to, uh, I'm going to draw this as a PMOS amplifier. Okay? So it's a diff differential to single-ended thing, right? So you've got... This 
the bias. This is going to be VIC plus VID over 2, VIC minus VID over 2, V out. This is M1, this is M1, this is M2, this is M2, this is M0. Now, I've called both devices here M1. That's not always standard convention. I choose to do this because we know that this device is identically sized to that device. So that when I say W over L1, I'm talking about the W over L of both of, of both of these devices, right? Similarly here, and well, M0 is its own thing. So, um, so that's the core circuit. And what I will do is, okay. Professor Broderson went over the common mode gain of this circuit, and um, he did that, I think, on Wednesday's lecture. And I just wanted to briefly go over it again so that you understand what the common mode gain. We all know that ADM is equal to GM1 times RO1 parallel RO2. Okay, so what about the common mode gain? And so first off, what the common mode gain is defined as, is defined as delta, or the, basically the, der the partial derivative, so a small change in V out over a small change in VIC. Okay? So the, the analysis of this is actually really, really simple once you have one basic insight. And the basic insight is this. So there's no differential input voltage here. Okay? The question is, when, when it's purely common mode stimulus on the input pair, what, is, what do we know about the output voltage V out? Does anyone want to venture a guess? All right, well, in the interest of time, I will answer my own question. Um, volunteering is always encouraged. The voltage at V out is going to be equal to the drain voltage over here. If we, let's call this Vx. Vx is going to be equal to V out. Now why is that? It's because the circuit is perfectly symmetrically stimulated. It's got a, it's got, everything is perfectly symmetric. We know that, so let's look at M1 first. The voltage at the source of, M, of M1 left and M1 right is equal. The voltage at the gate of M1 left and M1 right are also equal. Okay? The voltage at the gate of M2 left and M2 right are equal. So these guys have identical VGSs. So because of that, basically the currents in, in these two devices are going to be equal, which means that the currents in these two devices are going to be equal. And the only way for that to be perfectly maintained is for this vol the VDS of this device and this device to be equal, similarly this device and this device. So you can sort of see that the only way for symmetry to be maintained is for V out to exactly equal Vx, okay? So because of that, we can make this connection, okay? And I'll put this in parentheses because usually that's not there. And then once we do that, we can do this. And Bob went one way, I'm going to go another way. I'm going to go to the half circuit. Yes? Purely common mode. So... All right, so what we can do is we can split. This is M0. This is a half unit of M0. We're splitting M0 in half. This is M1, M1, M1. M2. M2, it's like that, okay? And this is half M0. So I mean, using, so, so all I've done is split M0 into two parts. And once we do that, we can basically just to end, uh, do that. We can take half of this circuit and get the following. So you get a half size device of M0 VIC M1 
M2, V out. This is the common mode equivalent circuit. The common, the, the common mode equivalent half circuit. Does everyone get how I got to that? Yeah? Good. So from here, we can convert this into something that looks a little bit more sensible. M1. Now, what's the, resist what's the resistance of a half-sized M0 device? 2R0, right? If we know what, if we, we assume we already know what the small signal parameters are. 2R0. And what's, what's the resistance looking down this way of this diode connected M2? 1 over GM2. Perfect. And this is V out, and this is VIC. So now getting the gain of this guy, this is just a um, source degenerated common source amplifier, simple one transistor amplifier. And as I said numerous times, the more times you can reduce amplifier, reduce complex circuits to simpler equivalents, good thing. Makes your analysis a lot simpler. So we know that that the that the and the gain here is so AVCM is equal to GM1 over so the the net transconductance of this device, which is GM1 times one plus oops GM1 times 2 R0. Okay. So that's the that's the net transconductance of the device. Then times the resistance looking down parallel the resistance looking up. So the resistance looking down is 1 over GM2. The resistance looking up is roughly equal to R01 GM1 2 times R0 R0, so this is R0, and this guy is much bigger than that guy, right? So basically AVCM is equal to GM1 over 1 plus GM1 2R out times 1 over GM2. You can make further simplifications to get roughly, oh, so this is roughly equal, you can make further simplifications. If you assume GM1 R out 0 is greater than 1, you get 1 over 2 R out 0 GM2. So again, the, the, so you can see that the common mode voltage gain of this amplifier is quite low. The differential mode voltage gain is basically GM R out to the first power. The common mode voltage gain of this guy is GM R out to the minus 1 power. So this is actually a really handy circuit. And it also does single-ended to differential conversion, which you will need to do eventually. Okay, so that's the common mode game. I'll take a short pause for any questions. Yeah? Yes? It's not diode connected, but what I showed before on this slide is that you can place basically a virtual diode connect here when when the input when the input on the when when the input stimulus is purely common mode. So it's not diode connected, but it acts as if it is. Yes. Well, here's the thing: as we move this up and down. This gate moves. So this gate and this drain move together. So yeah, it's not diode connected, but the mere fact that, that the, 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 the gate and the drain potential are always equal, it's as if there is a diode connect. So you can make that simplification. Like, like what I'm saying is that by adding this diode connect, I am not changing the, cir the behavior of the circuit at all. So once I say that, I can add it and, and continue my analysis sort of with impunity, ignoring the fact that I have changed the topology. But the point is that under all cases, the, the gate, the voltage here and the voltage at the output will be equal. Therefore, you can put a wire there and pretend it were always there for the purposes of common mode stimulus only. 
But my point is that you can pretend you have the wire there. Maybe we should talk about this after class, okay? There's no problem here because the gate and the drain voltage are always equal with pretending that there's a wire there. Okay? All right. So now, um, now we're going to get rid of this wire because I don't want to have to redraw it. And now let's figure out what kind of common mode swing this guy can support. Okay? Because this very well might be your input stage. Okay? So, um, first things first, remember that the output voltage swing is plus minus 300 millivolts, right? And the gain has to be greater than 1,000, which means that the input swing is going to be less than 300 microvolts. So for the purposes of this analysis, the input swing is really, really small, and we can ignore it. Okay? Because all we're doing is figuring out what common mode swing we can support. All right. So now, in order to figure out what common mode swing the circuit can support, you need to figure out what the maximum allowable common mode voltage is and the minimum voltage. Do the subtraction, you've got your range, okay? So let's do it one at a time. All of you have this circuit hopefully written down, so I'm going to move it off the screen, on and off the screen, a little bit, and hopefully that won't affect you. Can we zoom out to get here to here? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So let's figure out what VIC max is. All right? So VIC max, what we need to maintain, as always, is that the d all devices are in saturation. So let's first look and see qualitatively what's going to happen as I bring VIC higher and higher. Anyone want to tell me? What device is going to get crunched? M0, exactly. As VIC goes higher and higher, the source the common source will also go higher and higher, and eventually M0 will get crushed. Okay? So that's the bad thing that happens. So let's figure out what the maximum voltage that can be allowed without crushing M0. Okay? So in order for M0 to be happy, um, we know that we need to ha maintain at least a VD sat 0 across it. Okay, so that means the maximum allowable voltage on this node is VDD minus VDSAT0. Okay, what do we know about the voltage drop from the input to that common source node? Anyone? Not tricky. Maybe I'm asking too simple a question, but someone please speak up. It's v say that once more. It's certain, you need at least a VT, but what else? VDSAT. You need, basically this is VGS1, which is by definition equal to, v, I'll draw bigger, VGS1 is equal to VT1 plus VDSAT1. Therefore, in order to keep everything happy, and remember that VT might be bias dependent depending on whether or not you have that source bulk connection. So VT is not necessarily 300 millivolts. So, so that means that we've got at least this voltage here and this voltage here. That means VIC max is equal to VDD. Then you just sort of subtract all the necessary voltages. Minus VD sat 0 minus VT1 minus VD sat 1. Now, I mentioned this in section. I'll mention it again. With PMOS devices, all of these quantities are actually negative. We're treating them as positive, so just, just to remove any possible ambiguity, let's do that. Absolute value. Okay? That was simple. Now, let's look at, let's look at this device, and let's figure out VIC min. So that's VIC max. Okay? So now let's look at this amplifier. We bring the common mode inputs lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. What device is going to get crunched? M2 will get crunched, as will M1. Okay? 
So realistically, what actually happens is that this device here will always be in saturation. And this voltage is going to be a VGS. So this voltage is actually going to impinge upon this M1. And that's the first thing that's going to happen. Okay? So let's figure out what, what the minimum VIC is in order to support this guy being in saturation. So I'll redraw it. Okay, so what do we, what can we say about the voltage here? VDSAT2, this will always be VDSAT2 plus VT2. And I'm putting the subscripts on the threshold voltages because M1 is a PMOS, M2 is an NMOS. So there's no guarantee that those threshold voltages will be at all the same. Okay, so now, if this is here, and this voltage is going to be happy, what's the minimum, and, and M1 is going to be happy, what's the minimum source voltage that this can be? Plus VDSAT1, right, so this is, so well, this is plus an additional VDSAT1, okay, and then now let's go from the source back to the gate. So in going in that direction, what do we do? We subtract a VT and a VDSAT, VT1 and VDSAT1. So VIC must be greater than VDSAT2 plus VT2 plus VDSAT1 minus VDSAT1 plus VT1. Okay? The VDSAT ones cancel, and you get VDSAT2 plus VT2 minus VT1. There you go. So now you know, based on that, that so what, what we have here are some minimum requirements on VDSAT2, VDSAT1, and VDSAT0 in order to support your common mode swing, right? So because we know that VIC min has to be greater than some, some of these guys, VDSAT max has to be less than some of these guys, and there you've got your range. Okay? Any questions? All right. That's diff pairs. Bang, bang. All right. What's next? Output stages. So, Possible output stages include things like source followers, common sources, or even other complicated output stages that you haven't really learned. All right. Can anyone tell me um, whether or not a source follower can be used for this amplifier? I see. Do you want to volunteer as to why? I see you shaking your head no. Um, the bias, uh, we don't have enough um, output swing. Exactly, exactly. The output swing needs to go from 900 millivolts to 300 millivolts. V out. Okay, and let's assume that we had a PMOS source follower, okay, working here. We know that this is going, the drop here is going to be VT plus VDSAT of this follower. VT is 300 millivolts. So that means this node will be at least 300 millivolts less than this. So therefore, when, when you have to output 300 millivolts, this guy will be at ground or below, and nothing can supply the voltage in order to get this node low enough. Can't do source followers. So what you're really going to end up doing is doing some kind of basically a common source stage, okay? And so since the last thing I drew was PMOS, this time I'm going to draw an NMOS common source stage. So we've got our common source stage. And I'm drawing the whatever is supplying the bias just as a current source because, well, I want to. Um, 
So this is RL equals one kilo ohm. And this connects to VDD over two, which is equal to 600 millivolts. All right. So now we've got this. So the question is, well, this guy needs to swing from 900 millivolts to 300 millivolts. Okay. So the first question that you might want to figure out in terms of analyzing the circuit is, what bias currents do you need? Like IB, what's the value of IB that you need? And can anyone tell me what a bare minimum value for the bias current would be? Ten microamps. Okay, so let's see what would happen if, if the output stage were ten microamps. When this thing swings to um, 900 millivolts, okay, what's gonna what what current is going to be flowing across this resistor? It's going to be 300. There's going to be 300 millivolts across the resistor, so there's going to be 300 microamps flowing in that direction, right? By KCL. And let's call this, if we call this device M7, just for the hell of it, this is I7. By KCL, IB equals 300 microamps plus I7. If IB were only 10 microamps, I7 would have to be negative. So therefore, and I7 can't be negative, and MOS devices can only sink current. So therefore, at a bare minimum, IB has to be greater than 300 microamps. Okay? Either that or you need to figure out a way, if you wanted to do a more complicated stage and, and, and do some analysis and make a circuit that we haven't analyzed in class yet, make a way for IB also to be signal dependent. Okay? It's not necessary for this course. If you do it and do it well, you could get some extra credit because you're, it's conceivable that you could consume a lot less power. But only do that after you figure out, like, more important, figure out the basics of the circuit. Okay? So IB has to be greater than 300 microamps. Now, <clears throat> something else to keep in mind is what's the. So now, actually, instead, let's pretend that this is a. Let's call this M6. This is actually a PMOS device that's providing you your current, so it's got some output impedance. So let me redraw it. What's the gain of this circuit? Again, not a hard question. The quicker one of you guys answers this, the more material we cover in class. GM7 times RL. It's actually RL parallel with RO7 parallel RO6. Right. AV. Now, realistically, RL is 1 kilo ohm. The R outs are going to be significantly larger than 1 kilo ohm. So it's basically GM RL, exactly what Josh said. So, therefore, <clears throat> you're not going to get super high gain out of this stage unless you have a very big GM. So having more current might give you a better G might give you a bigger GM and provide higher gain through this stage. So you might not want to go with the bare minimum, and that actually becomes more pertinent when you start talking about um, gain when the volt when the thing is swung out in one direction or another. So again, this is 600 millivolts. When this guy is 900 millivolts, this is 300 microamps. This is IB. So the current through M7 is IB minus 300 microamps, right? So that means the GM, because GM is proportional to the square root of 2 I D 2 K W. Ah, 2K W over L ID7, right? So therefore, at the 900 millivolt case, you've got 2K W over L 
IB minus 300 microamps. Therefore, if IB were 300, were 300 microamps plus a tiny fraction, when it swung out, the GM of this device would be very, very low. So the gain, GM times RL, would be very, very low as well. It would be basically zero. So therefore, you need a little bit more current in order to have the gain, uh, in order to not lose a tremendous amount of gain when you're swung out. And so using, using more current will mean that the GM is affected less proportionally, so therefore your gain is still maintained, but using more current means more power, and hence your figure of merit will be uh, degraded somewhat. And uh, Professor Broderson mentioned this in class, and I'll just mention it again just so that you really understand this. Uh, it is far more important for you to meet the specifications in the circuit, for the circuit, than to truly optimize figure of merit. Um, we will be grading on a relatively flat scale for the figure of merit. You know, we want to give more points to people who do really good jobs of figure of merits, but if by optimizing your figure of merit you end up not meeting all the specifications, trust me, your grade will suffer because of it. So that caveat said, throwing a little bit more current is probably a good thing because you need to meet the specifications and you want to get a good grade in this class. So, so the GM, so basically, by putting a little bit more current in this output stage, you can keep the gain of this output stage relatively high or, rel or not so low, such that your overall gain spec is met. That's not the only way to meet the gain spec, however. You could, if you were to conceivably in your first stage amplifier, have an incredibly high gain, say arbitrarily a million, you're not going to be able to do that, but let's say you could, um, then it doesn't really matter what the gain of this output stage is. So what I'm saying is that you can have some level of trade-off between how much the worst case gain of the output stage is, and hence how much power you consume in the output stage, versus how much over-design of the gain in the first stage there is. There is not a gain range specification. In other words, your gain does not need to be particularly flat over the output swing. In general, that's a good property, and in past years that has been a specification. Because this project has been handed out a little earlier than in years past, we removed that specification. The gain only needs to be higher than 1,000. Okay? So, um, I think that covers the output stage. The only other thing to keep in mind is swings and VD sats. So, let's look at this stage again. So, M7, M6. So obviously, the swing of this circuit is basically, you know, VDD minus VDSAT6 minus VDSAT7. Pretty obvious. But the, th the, the one tricky business is that this swing, like, so Vmin, so Vmin of the output is equal to VDSAT7, right? So that would mean, okay, you look at this and say, I need to get this output voltage to 300 millivolts. Therefore, VDSAT7 has to be no bigger than 300 millivolts. That is true, but remember that when this is at 300 millivolts, this will be IB. Now there will be 300 millivolts, 300 microamps flowing in that direction. So now I7 is equal to IB plus 300 microamps, and VDSAT7, in terms of current and the device size, which is what you have control over, is equal to 2I7 over K prime W over L. So I7 is IB plus 300 microamps. Yeah, thank you. So therefore, basically, again, <coughs> you're, if, if IB is, is relatively low, like 300 microamps, then when you throw that additional 300 microamps, your VDSAT's going to double. Or excuse me, not double, increase by root 2. So the more current you throw at it in the bias condition, the less change there is in VDSAT. 
So there are, there are ways to design it such that you don't want to throw too much current because then you'd require a lot of area. But again, it's a basic trade-off of how much current your output stage meets, it consumes, and how that impacts on the specification. Okay? All right. So that covers output stages. Sure. Oh, what's the reason that you connect the uh, resistor to the VDD over two instead of ground? Um, that's basically to have a symmetric current load. Um, the uh, I mean, what what's been done in years past has also been having the positive supply be connected to VDD over two, the negative supply connected to minus VDD over two, and then the load connected to ground. It's the same thing, right? It's just everything shifted up. And the reason why is so that, that that resistor sources and sinks current rather than just goes in one direction. And that that forces a, some additional constraints on your output stage. Because realistically, loads will tend to be symmetric. Like if you, have a, if you source a certain amount of current into a load, then you'll have to sink it out of the load as well. That, that same amount. So that's just the way, that's the way we did it to, to do it. OK. Um, quick show of hands, who wants to see the multi-stage amp bias interconnect first, and who wants to see the test bench first? So multi-stage amp. In other words, how to connect up multiple stages of amplifiers such that in their nominal bias condition they work. Who wants to, s to see me talk about the test benches? All right, multi-stage amps it is. All right, so... So now, just to keep things, keep you on your toes, I'm going to make So the first stage, so we're going to do a, an example two-stage amplifier. Okay. And so this might very well be your input stage, right? Now, you're not going to be able to get all your gain and all your swing out of this stage. You're simply not going to be able to, to do it. You're going to need a second stage. And so that second stage very well may be a, uh, a common source stage. Okay? I mean, that's kind of what we concluded in our previous discussion. So, so if we have this as our input stage, NMOS input stage, any, do, you, do you have any sense as to what would make a better output stage? Should the output stage be a PMOS common source or an NMOS common source? PMOS. Why? What do you mean? Yeah, you're 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 absolutely on the right track. So I'll help you along a little bit. So basically, as we discussed before, when these two voltages are equal, the voltage here will be equal to the voltage here, which is equal to the voltage here. So let's call this V mid, and let's call this V mid will equal Vx, right? And Vx happens to be a pretty well controlled voltage. It happens to be the voltage such that the VGS across M2 sources a known amount of current. So we've, des we've designed M0 to source, I'm going to call this 2ID. Okay? So ID flows here, ID flows here, ID flows here, and here. So what we know now is that v mid, Vx is the right voltage to put on the gate of a transistor to source ID. We may as well use that elsewhere. We may as well use that on another PMOS transistor. So, 
what would be very sensible to do, if this is W2 over L2, is to make M3 ratioed to M2. Make it K times W2 over L2. So it's, it's basically putting K parallel devices, K devices in parallel of type M2. Okay? So what's the current, the bias current of M3 going to be? K times ID. So let me draw this here. So this is VDD over 2. RL, RL. Okay. So at the nominal bias point, when the two common modes are equal, we want this to be pretty close to 600 millivolts, or VDD over 2. It doesn't need to be exactly that, but it's good if for a zero differential input, your output is right in the middle of your swing, right? That means that you only have to swing up 300 and down 300. Whereas if this were like at 800 millivolts, then you'd have to swing up 100 to get to 900 and then swing down 500. And that's, it's just kind of imbalanced, okay? So therefore, if this is at VDD over 2 and this is at VDD over 2, there's no current, current through this resistance equals 0. So in order to satisfy this, that means M4 has to be, have that same amount of current. Well, we so happen to have M4 connected to a, on the same gate voltage as M0. So now, if we make M4 equal to K over 2 W0 over L0, then M4 will also want to sync K times ID. So by doing this sort of thing, you get the same voltage here, the same voltage, same current here. Same, you, you get controlled currents in your output stage. That's basically what I'm saying. You, you, you're able to control the exact current in your output stage and also get this output node, this is the out here, right, to be basically where you want it to be. Okay? Now, this is not perfect, and the reason this is not perfect is twofold. One is that M0 VGS0 equals VGS4 right? That's by construction. But VDS0 does not equal VDS4. So these currents won't be exactly ratioed to one another. However, if lambda is high enough, then they'll be pretty close. Okay? So you're getting within the right ballpark. Similarly, um, say, same argument can be made for these devices, right? You know, this guy has a VDS of 600 millivolts. This has a VDS of VX. So the currents won't be exactly equal. So, so this voltage will slosh around a little bit in order to, to meet KCL. But the saving grace here is that you've got an RL of around a kilo ohm. I'll be with you in just one second. Uh, that'll suck out any extra current. And this is a relatively low impedance voltage. So this low impedance node because of this RL. So that'll kind of pull out any extra current that might want to be sloshing around in there. And so your output voltage might not be exactly 600 millivolts with zero input common, in, in, zero input differential, but it'll be relatively close. Yeah? But why did you write K over 2 W? Uh, because, because M0 is sized to source 2 ID. We want this to source K ID. So to go from 2 ID to K ID, you have to make it K over 2. And it's just because this M0 sources both of these devices. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, he allowed you to do that. I don't think you need it. I didn't need it. I did this. I've done this design problem. So what, what he said is if you want to, so these are your input nodes, right? And in the handout, it says in pretty big letters, no voltage sources or current sources are allowed within your sub-circuit, period, the end. That policy has been changed slightly in that you are allowed one voltage source of absolute value less than a millivolt to put a small differential tilt in this amplifier to get the output to what, exactly what you want it to be. You don't need it. But... If it really makes your life easier, do it.
If you really need it, however, my personal opinion is that you're probably there's probably something else in your circuit that isn't quite right that you should be spending more time more attention with, rather than using this to fix it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, but that's not, that's not a strict requirement of this, of this amplifier. And if you want to do it just for your own sake, and chances are that if you don't do it, this output voltage will be, I don't know, probably 620 millivolts, which means that 20 microamps is being sourced through this resistance. And the mismatch between these two currents, if you're talking about in the ballpark of several hundred microamps, the mismatch between these two will not be more than a few tens of microamps. So realistically, it might be off by a little bit, but it's just not the end of the world. Okay. So that covers the bias interconnect. Um, finally, last topic, and it looks like we'll just get to it, and I may run two or three minutes over, but you guys should be used to that by now. Um, is a test bench, and I need to get the test bench. All right, unfortunately, I can't find all of my notes on the test bench. So I might not be able to do a very good job of explaining this, but I will try. So test, there are two test benches that you can use. Um, the notes explain how to use them, and the scripts we give you make it very, very easy to use. Uh, you should give it a shot with the sample circuit that's provided that just has a bunch of ideal amplifiers in it, just to get a sense as to what how you run it and what kind of outputs. Just out of curiosity, who has who has used our test bench scripts just to play around with them, and at least to play around with them? So around half of you. Give it a shot. It's not a bad idea. Okay. So test bench two. Can you see any of it? All right. Great. Thanks. So I'll start working working down it, um, line by line. So test bench two. What this is used for is it. Uh, analyzes your voltage gain at when when the when the output is swung out in one direction or the other so this first line just is setting vdd to point 1.2 the second line is setting the common mode voltage applied to the parameter vic that you specify this guy instantiates your amplifier it is very 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 important in your sub circuit definition that you keep the pin ordering the same as how it is in the uh, handout so that basically what we're doing is your 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 amplifier is basically like a chip that we're kind of dropping into this board if you want to call it and the pins are ordered one through five we need to make sure that the pins that we, the way we think they're ordered is the way you actually order them so if you don't change anything it'll fit in perfectly okay so here is a netlist um, Bang, 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 bang. These guys are, your, are, the, are the rest of your net list. Um, geez. All right, it's been a while since I've looked at this, so you'll forgive me. So what we have here is EDP is a voltage-controlled voltage source from node to node NP to common with one-half V of node end, and then one half V end, and this is in negative. These two go to your amplifier, so you can sort of see this is your amp, and this node is called node out. Okay, and this node is called common. So you can sort of see that what I'm building here is the standard differential drive for amplifiers. And so common, so there's another thing, plus minus, that's a node uh, that applies VIC test 
which is basically the common mode that you specify. So you can see how this very straightforward. Okay? And so instead of applying V diff, we're applying the voltage at, at node end. Okay? So so V I D is just equal to V the voltage at node end. And so the voltage at node end, which stands for in differential, um, Oops, I'm looking at test bench one. No wonder. Okay. Well, let's finish up with test bench one. I won't go over test bench two. So basically what this does is then, I was wondering what this looked odd. This is to VDD over, there's a voltage source here, plus minus. This is V mid. So this is attached to 600 millivolts. And there's this RL here. And so V end is controlled by VID. So there's this voltage source called VID to node end. So this is how you set up that differential mode drive. And unfortunately, I went over the, the, the less interesting test bench. And then later on, now let's go back. So that's what the netlist is translated to. And you really shouldn't have to look at this because you should be able to look at this and come up with this just like I did. So now let's look at what the statements are. So the first analysis, so the analysis statements, you've got an operating point. Now this dot .op stuff is really useful. Um, what it does is it gives you the operating point of your circuit. So it gives the node voltages, it gives all the branch currents, and it also gives you the small signal operating parameters for each, trans each device. So you can use it, you can look through that output to verify that the GM of your device is what you expect it to be. Okay? So this transfer function is basically saying, okay, calculate the transfer function from the input VID to the output. Okay? And then each of these dot alter statements, and then what follows, is, a <coughs> is um, is a way to run another analysis with the same thing except for what's altered. So now the input common mode is changed to what you specify plus 0.25 millivolts and then minus 0.25 millivolts and then further down here um, now you, we do the same set of tests but looking at the gain from the output from excuse me from input common mode to output. So that's how we do all those tests. The more interesting test bench is test bench number two, which unfortunately I didn't get to. Um, if you have questions about how it works, post it to the news group and we'll try to answer them. Yeah. Um, so is VIC something we specify? VIC project? is a parameter. Yeah, if you look at the handout, see if I can find it real quick. The supplementary handout, which I cannot find right now. It's somewhere in here. Um, it'll say that what you should, okay, so just real clear because we're not having another section. Two minutes of your time. Um, what you should hand in, submit, in terms of the circuit is very clearly specified in one of the handouts, in the supplementary handout. You should be, hand in, you should be emailing to us a circuit, uh, an email with the sub-circuit definition and the dot param statement of what your input common mode voltage should be. The format is very clearly specified. Make sure you follow that. Make sure that the names of all the people are in the in the title, excuse me, in the subject, name, names of the two people working on the project, or one person, is in the subject line of the email and nothing else. Mail it to EE140 at Corey, um, and the only thing in the body should be the, sub the, the, the text that's specified there. Um, Anything else with that? One email per group. One email per group. Yeah. Um, I don't know that we necessarily, we don't really have the infrastructure set up to keep track of multiple submissions. So please try to make your one submission your one submission. <laughs> don't send other emails to EE140. The only purpose of that mailbox is for the project submission. Also, we will be evaluating your circuit based on the performances of the test benches that we have provided. 
as a final sanity check, it makes sense for you to make sure you pass all the specifications. For those of you who have not tried running the test benches, it really provides some really nice functionality. If you pass the specs, you'll get green text that says OK. If you don't pass, you'll get red text that says failed. And if your circuit doesn't work, you'll get red text indicating that your circuit doesn't work. So you want to see a bunch of green text that says OK on all the specifications. If you do that, and if you haven't you know, included little voltage sources or done little cheats in your sub-circuit, you're in really good shape. Okay? Have a good weekend. Good luck on the project. Email questions.